Again, we're grateful for everyone who has gathered with us tonight. We don't take your presence for granted. We're having a fellowship in the truth. Amen. Welcome those who are with us on live stream also. <clears throat> Pray that there'll be a, a very effective fellowship that's transmitted through the air, so to speak. This will be our 31st lesson in Amos. We're going to be in the fifth chapter, verses 19 and 20. Now these, uh, as we have mentioned before, are hard things to, to teach. Not because they're mysterious. They're right up front. I mean, you if you miss what they mean, I mean, you really... <laughs> We need to pray for you. But you're being introduced to God. We're being introduced to God here. This is a facet of God that's got to be seen. <clears throat> I want to remind you that in these days that we're talking about here in Amos, they didn't have a Savior from sin. They didn't have justification by faith. They didn't have reconciliation to God. They didn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the apostles' doctrine. See, those are all benefits we have. And if we did not, we would be experiencing this in this country. This... These things would be duplicated. God would bring the hammer down so hard it'll make as a prayer of prophet both your ears tingle. So it's not because we're better. Because we have an intercessor. Now it is arresting, mind boggling, challenging to consider how far sin can take a person away from God. Now, you may speculate about it and say, I'd never do that, I'd never do that, but you, <laughs> it's just a lot of vain speculation. Yeah. Amen. Sin takes you further yeah. than you want to go. Amen. Believe me, well, we're seeing it. That's what, this, that's what these records are written for. When we read a scathing denunciation of the prophets, we come to realize the unimaginable power of transgression. Sin and transgression has power. It's not as great as God's power, but it's too great. It's greater than man's power. Sin is just not something that people do, but something they commit. Sin has traits of its own. It's akin to a serpent's venom, deadly. Sin distorts the mind so a person can't think right. Do things that maybe at one time they thought were stupid, they whoop and they do them. Sin does that to a person. It's a, it's a powerful persuader. It can lead people to do things that they might have thought sometime back they'd never do. But sin's a powerful persuader, a corrupt teacher that works with the devil under his auspices. <coughs> and it so blinds the mind that neither sin nor righteousness are really seen for what they are. A person who's in the grips of sin doesn't see how bad sin is. It doesn't see how good righteousness is. He doesn't see how wicked Satan is and how righteous God is. See, he can't can't see it. Well, we it's good to know that you don't have to sin to know these things. Amen. Adam and Eve knew about that tree before they ever ate of it. But they needed something beside human power to not do it. You should pick up on that like right away. This is the only perfect pair that has ever lived in the history of the world. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the first time they confronted the devil, they sank like a rock. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
to God. What's God telling? Some people say, well, did God know they were going to fall? Well, people like this, these are too ignorant to listen to. They each need to go home and work in the yard or something. They, they shouldn't be commenting. God, God is telling the race something about this. That you can't get along without me. Amen. That's what God is telling people. Even if you're the first two people and you're perfect, morally perfect, you're innocent, you've never sinned, you still need me. Yeah. And if you listen to someone beside me, yeah. Amen. now you know what happened. Amen. It still happens. Sin debilitates the soul so that the soul becomes more and more hard, like a, like a callous hard. And like Adam and Eve, it always yields effects. We'd like to be able to tell people, don't worry, when you, God forgives your sin, you'll, there won't be any after effects, but we, um, we can't say that. That's right. Well, some of us know it right firsthand, right up front. I, I, know, it, I know it by experience. Yes. So. so we plead with people, don't. Don't launch out on the sea of sin. You can't. Don't do it. Now that is, is the sort of thing Amos is doing. He's acquainting us with God and the effects of sin and what it does. It throws you in a downward spiral, like a vortex, like a whirlpool. It sucks you in. And it's good for us to pay attention to it. It's not... It's not pleasant to talk about. I'm, I'll be the first to tell you that. It's not pleasant to talk about, but as Paul would say, for you, it is safe. Amen. Yeah. It's just you don't want to grow up and not know this about God. A lot of people have, you know. A lot of people have gone to church for many, many years. They don't know this about God. They think God's not like this. Yeah. They'll argue with you over this. Now we're going to be in verses 19 and 20. <coughs> He's just told the people, Woe to you that desire the day of the Lord. These, there, there are a people, they may say they're anxious for the Lord to come, but, but they shouldn't be. <laughs> they shouldn't be. There's some people, Woe to them if the Lord comes, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. Then he takes it from there, as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear meet him. The bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Even very dark, and no brightness at all as to people that are in sin. So let's look at this uh, text. It's, it's quite uh, quite vivid. <clears throat> Remember, he said in verse eighteen, "Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord." To what end is it for you? What <laughs> what advantage do you think you're going to get when Jesus comes? Yeah. I've been to funerals. People, godless people. If I preach godless people or godless funerals, and I had to tell people these people were godless. Don't follow them. Yeah. Had to tell them that. Some people would preach those funerals and say, now they're free at last. They're with their loved ones in the heaven. I can hear the footsteps. Oh, yeah, I've heard all this. No, sinners need to be told, look, you ought to be giving thanks tonight that Jesus hasn't come yet because if he did, you'd have been in hell just as sure as I'm standing here. Don't be afraid to tell people that. Mm -hmm. I thank God someone wasn't afraid to tell me when I was in a Amen. bad state. <clears throat> a man, as in a man did flee from a lion. <clears throat> now Amos has drawn a number of parallels already. Speaking about God is in, a, in a comparisons. He compares 
compares it with something people are familiar with. Because, see, people aren't familiar with the wrath of God. You're, no one can can look at the wrath of God. It consumes you. So you, you can't, like, learn about the wrath of God. So he makes the comparisons. He said in Amos 5, 6, he's like breaking out like fire, like a fire, like an explosion, just ex, just an explosion of massive fire. Saving a remnant, he said, is like taking two legs and a piece of a lamb's ear out of the mouth of a lion. It's like, that's like saving a remnant. <laughs> what a vivid picture. Yeah. Two legs and a piece of an ear. That's a remnant of people. With a whole, whole lamb. But all that was left yeah. of that whole lamb was two legs and an ear. Yeah. And we went over that. Sister Melissa told me she was a piece of an ear. <laughs> yeah. yeah, some of you were too, a piece of an ear. That's what a remnant is. He's, he's making comparisons, showing you. The saving of a remnant would be like a firebrand plucked out of the burning. He used that too, see? He's like, here's a bonfire, yeah. and out of his own discretion, yes. with no apparent reason, yeah. with no apparent reason, he reaches in and he yeah. pulls one stick out of it. Yeah. Say, why did you do that? He said, none of your business. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> this is God we're talking about. Amen. He plucked Lot out of Sodom. Yeah. Yeah. Pulled him right out of there. Amen. And God's like a roaring lion. Like a man fleeing from a lion. See, it's someone trying to get away from the judgment of the Lord. He's like a man trying to run away from a lion. And God had already told Amos that God is roaring like a lion. Mm -hmm. Yes? I was just going to say, from our perspective, it looked, people think, well, I chose him, you know. Yeah. I chose to believe. People yeah. talk this way. From our perspective, it looks like that. From his perspective, he says, I plucked you out like That's a brand out of the fire. Amen. 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 That's the only reason you are believing. Anyway. Amen. Yeah. I gathered them. That's another yeah. one, yeah. The point is here that there's no way man can comprehend the, the magnitude of God's wrath and indignation. It extends beyond their comprehension. So we got to make comparisons, couch it in parables, what, because there's no way you'd understand it otherwise. In other words, he's trying to wake, Amos is trying to wake Israel up. He says earlier, he said in chapter 4, verse 12, prepare to meet thy God. Get, get ready, because God's going to get up. And going to do something about this situation that's been going on for centuries. Israel had been engulfed in sin for centuries. God now going to do something about it. So get ready Amen. to face him. Then he used these words, as if. i draw another parallel here. As if. <coughs> Even though sin is dominant, it's not ordinary. You know, you got to pick up on what I just said there. Sin is dominant, but it's not ordinary. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God, but that's not ordinary. So we're going to give an as if. Compares the nation of Israel with something very unusual. We're going to talk about a man... That is one who's made in the image of God, after the similitude of God, marred though it may be, talking about a man, not talking about a beast, talking about a man. So not like like an Israel to a predicament that's ordinary, but one that's ex extraordinary. Be like a man. <laughs> fleeing from a lion. Can you get the picture now? I guess you get the picture of an open field, and here's this man trying to outrun this voracious lion that's roared. And <laughs> well, who like? What do we have? A, do we have a hundred yard sprinter that could out do the? Why well, somebody's lying run fifty mile an hour? Yeah. Yeah. Fastest man in the world couldn't 
no comparison at all. But here's this. He says, it's like a man. I'm going to make Israel like a man trying to run away from a roaring, hungry lion. There he is out there in the open field, and he's a running Transgressors always run. When they know God's at hand, they'll, they'll start running. But the Spirit can wake them up so they'll say, have mercy on me. Amen. That's, right. That's the thing to do. Uh -huh. yes. That's the thing to do. Uh -huh. If God catches you in sin, don't try and run. Yeah. Ask for mercy. Yes. Amen. Though I used to get me sometime, we had six stair-step children, the first six stair step children. Sometimes nobody'd fess up who who was a transgressor, so they'd all get a licking. And once it started, now everybody got one. My uh, boys can testify to you; they remember a lot. <laughs> so someone defined it, and even if someone fessed up, it's it's too late. You got to fess up before. Then they'd settle it after it was over. They'd settle the matter between themselves. But some some children would run and grab up with their little grab a hold of my leg like this. I couldn't I couldn't really thrash them though. No. I <laughs> I had there'd be a little length out there to really but when they hug you you that's what you want to do with God. Yeah. Amen. God's upset with you, you embrace him. Appeal to his mercy, see? Israel did. They're like a man trying to run away from a lion, trying to outrun a hungry lion. Whatever he meets a bear. He's worse, bear's worse than a lion. But it comes to being ferocious. Running a lion, I can just look. I'm looking behind him. He turns off. Whoop, there's a big, really big bear. That's what it's like running from God, from the lion to the bear. In other words, you can't get away. So whenever the Lord cries out, come unto me, you just best do that. Go to him. Meant by a bear. Now through Hosea, God set forth a, a similar situation. It's got the same language. It's in Hosea 13, 6 through 8. According to their pasture, so were they filled they were filled, and their heart was exalted. Therefore have they forgotten me. Therefore I will be unto them as a lion. As a leopard, by the way, will I observe them. They were stalking them. Others. I will meet them as a bear that has been bereaved of her whelps or robbed of her cubs. And will rend the call called your chest cavity, I'll rend the call of their heart. That is, I'll yank their heart right out of their chest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's, that's some kind of language. Yeah. And there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. Why did he talk like that? Well, he had to to get it within range of their understanding. Uh -huh. they, they, they didn't grasp it. He didn't delight in doing things like this. But this is God's nature. This is God's nature. Now, God can't smile and be indifferent to sin. He can't. It isn't that he doesn't want to or that's what he, his nature won't allow him to be. Now, Brother Judah. Yeah, on this example of fleeing from a lion, thought you did make the point that lions are incredibly ferocious and tenacious when either endangered themselves when they're in danger or they can be like that when their cubs or their pride are in yeah. danger. So I thought I thought of the text, if God be for us, who can be against us? God is a lion, but if you're in the lion's clan, the tribe or the pride, yeah. <laughs> then you'll have just as much protection as That's the right. enemies don't have it. That's right. Mm -hmm. You got this picture, didn't you? Run from a lion, met a bear. That's, that's quite a picture. In other words, the longer you run, the worse it gets. Huh? The longer you delay, the worse it gets. Well, I was, I was raised under this approach. 
Yeah, and then that was one of those, I had to get a whipping every day. So why I say whipping now, these were genuine whippings every day. That's how stupid I was when I was young, every day. I was reminded, yeah, the foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child, but the rod will drive it far from him. There was no sit on the couch at my house when I was raised. Mm -mm. You just got the pain the way God is. Or we'd have really been out of, or we really would have been gone. Right, yeah. Amen. I was thinking this in raising children not to tolerate sin. That's know, right. I mean, because if you smile at it or, or whatever, then they, then they perceive that as being okay, and then uh -huh. they can go a little further. <laughs> did, you, did you see that in Hosea when he said he was going to be like a bear robbed of her whelps or, or cubs? The reason was because... They have forgotten me. Yes, amen. That's the reason. That's, right. That's what angered God. That's right. And you trace two of the prophets, they'll quite frequently will make mention they forgot me. Uh -huh. but yes, Brother Jason. The thought, the thought came to me when you were talking about God's nature just a moment ago that, that people today tend to underestimate God's nature, and they do so in, in, in either extreme. They, they, some, people, some people don't realize... <laughs> how merciful and loving yeah, God amen, really is. Amen. He's God is more loving, more merciful than people tend to think He is. Amen. On the other hand, He's also more righteous and holy than people tend That's right. to, yeah. to think He is. I think today, today we we kind of have a watered down, lukewarm kind of God. Yeah. That's right. It's kind of a passionless. That's right. Kind of God. Yeah. Now, when Jesus was here in the flesh. As you read the Gospels, people were often shocked by Jesus' reactions to things. Mm -hmm. Either in one direction or another. Remember, they were they were shocked. Simon was shocked that he let that sinful woman touch his feet. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. How merciful he was shocked at how merciful he was. Yes, mm -hmm. amen. And they were shocked too when he made a whip of cords and run them all out of the temple. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, people can feel guilty for what they've done and yet still not go to God, you know. Adam and Eve, they sewed fig leaves together. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, the, the Achan, he buried it. I mean, he yeah. maybe he in his mind, he thought, well, at least if I don't use it, I'll just bury it. But the, the, that wasn't the answer. The, they can't undo yeah. sin. Yeah, and, and coming to God is the only remedy mm -hmm. to where you can you can fend off this meeting of the bear. Amen. Yeah. See, the early yeah. church <coughs> found it difficult to believe that Saul of Tarsus was converted. Yeah, that's right. Yep. That's part of what Jason's talking about yeah. here. Yep. They didn't see the extent mm -hmm. of God's mercy upon this person. Made havoc. He made havoc of the church. But that's the truth. God is, his mercy extends beyond man's understanding just as well as his wrath. Mm -hmm. But Jesus will make, make this known. He'll persuade a person how merciful God is so they'll return. He'll persuade a person how indignant he is with sin so they'll repent. Amen. See, that's, that's God's the way God works. <clears throat> yeah, the problem with, with men trying to come to a right conclusion, again, is you have got to start with and end up with God being perfectly righteous. Yes. Both his mercy and his <coughs> yes. wrath are righteous. Righteous, amen. And his judgments in, in what what is determined uh, against or for someone is a matter of his righteousness. Mm -hmm. And whenever whenever God forgives, remember Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Yes. It was imputed to him. It was God's righteousness that was at stake. It was God's righteousness that was imputed. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any other righteousness that God would accept. There is no other righteousness Amen. God will accept. Mm -hmm. right. So whenever people look at a situation, there are things that we can see. But if, if our vision and our understanding of the righteousness of God <laughs> is not accurate to that extent, our assessment will be inaccurate. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, <coughs> they run like a, 
as if, as if a man was running from a lion and met a bear. What God is saying is, Israel has gone too far. He's not going to liquidate Israel as a nation, but there's a generation that's going to... Yeah. Just like the generation of Jesus, their generation was rejected. There was a remnant saved, but the generation was rejected. Yeah. That's what he said. I'm not going to let anybody pray for you. Mm. Yeah, Jeremiah, I give you the text here. God told Jeremiah, don't pray for this people. Yeah. Right. If you do, I won't hear you. And if they pray, I won't hear them. Why? Three, yet four transgressions. Remember, we, they went, they crossed the line. They went too far. See, how, how do I know if I went too far? Well, if you came back, you didn't go too far. Got back. Yeah, well, that's the only, yeah, that's the only, only what he recognizes, yeah. Uh -huh. A kind of... It's like someone says, if it's genuine faith. Well, there isn't anything, but that's what there isn't any this is genuine faith. We had, we had some, for instance, we had some that were in Babylon with Ezekiel. Yeah. And they would come to the prophet and ask for a word from the Lord, and the Lord said, I'll not be inquired of these right. men. They still have idols in their hearts. What are you doing here? Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. That's the same thing's going to be addressed here. Yeah. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what will the day of the Lord advantage you? He already has. That's the same thing. Now, what happened, God, can God come to the point where he will abhor and hate people he chose and delivered? Yeah. Is that possible? Well, we, um, we don't have to speculate about this. This is the psalm that says, Psalm 78, 58, 59. The Lord, the Lord kindled it. The wrath, therefore, it was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. God was moved to jealousy with the graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred. Israel, not, not the Egyptians, not the Amalekites, Israel. So, yeah, this is an aspect of God that has pretty well been hidden in our day. Yeah. You can always come back. That's it right. doesn't matter. See, that's, that's the right. kind of message that's being preached. Yeah. It doesn't matter what, well, there's, there's a sense that's in which right. that's true. Yeah, it's. They forget that some people don't want to come back. Yeah, yeah. that's right. They gnaw their tongues for pain. Yeah, right? that's right. Blaspheme God yeah. under uh -huh. pressure. Amen. Now, what we just read here is an ex an extension of a word that was already given mm -hmm. in the 18th verse. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? That is, what, mm -hmm. what advantage? If the Lord shows up, do you really think it's going to bring an advantage to you? You'll start running like a man runs from a lion. Uh -huh. You'll run into a bear. That's right. That's what will happen. So, see, there are a lot of people who will say they're looking forward to Christ coming, but it's just, right. it's just words that, that they don't understand. Mm. That they're the kind of people that they, his coming is not going to advantage at all. <laughs> There's still some that are told, well, Jesus is going to come back again mm -hmm. and establish a peaceful government, yeah, yeah. and then you'll have a second chance. You'll be able to... Mm -hmm. This is taught now. Come well, on. Yes, it Brother is. Jason, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to add that the people who say that, I can't help but think that the people who say that are particularly religious people. Oh, yeah, yes. It's a pretentious right. religious... There's a pretentious religiosity about people saying that they want the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, when in actuality, the day of the Lord is not something they should yeah. be wanting. There, there's some, there's some kind of religious pretense. Yeah. That makes someone that make that puts someone in that condition. They may, they may sing, "Oh, that will be glory for me." Yeah. They haven't fallen in this category. When all, we all get to heaven, yeah, uh -huh. they really like to sing a good tune and everything. 
Well, we got this man. He's running from a lion. He runs into a bear. But let's let's say that he got into an imagined place of safety. He did get out of the field and he got into a house. He went into the house, leaned his hand on a wall, and a serpent bit him. He couldn't get away. There it was. The house is safe. Most of the time, house will keep you from beasts of the earth and animals, sort of thing. But he's turning to another figure to show you you can't escape. Once you have stirred up God's wrath, there's no way to escape it. Amen. The objective is not to stir it up. Amen. Don't do it. Amen. And actually, God's given you a conscience, so your conscience will blow the whistle and flash some caution lights. You listen to them. <coughs> Or he went into a house. Now, this is not an either-or situation. This is two sides of the same coin. It's running from a lion, meeting a bear, coming in a house, a snake biting him. That's three different situ pictures of the same situation. They, they, couldn't get a, they couldn't get away. Yeah. Couldn't get away at all. Now, I, I, have, to, I have to give you... Dr. Peterson's take on this in the message where it says he entered into a house, he says a woman goes home after a hard day's work. Daddy. Daddy. Yeah, that's how he translated that. That's in what they call a Bible. Daddy. That's right, I'm telling you the truth. Well, wait till you hear it. I can tell you the rest of it. <laughs> and the safety of the home is accented here. But it's but the safety of the home, it doesn't work when you've agitated God. When God's provoked, there isn't a place of safety. A lot of places may have protected you under other circumstances, but it won't, it won't under this circumstance <coughs> at all. So in his figure, he's high. I said, home at last. He puts his hand and leans at rest, been running, leans, and a snake bites him out of the wall. How likely is that? Well, it's just as likely as taking a stroll in the field and find yourself being chased by a lion. Yeah. How likely is that? Yeah. Or running head on into a bear out in your field. How likely is that? Amen. That's point. That's what he's saying. That this is God will work, and you won't expect that He'll work this way. But this is what He'll, he'll get you. Snake bit him. Now, the picture here to me seems to be that of taking refuge in vain religion. Yeah. I, I got in the house. Yeah. I got in the house. Mm. I, I think we ought to, let's take a trip down to Bethel and offer a sacrifice to that golden calf down there. Let, let's try that. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's go and let's, let's sing one of those good old songs we sing when we're around the Lord. Well, if you bring it up to our day, let's go to church today. Let's give, let's give it a try and see if that helps. Maybe we go to where we can have a kind of a lively praise service and maybe we can get all caught up in it and forget how ignorant we've been and how sinful we've been. No, you can't get away from it at all. But this is to me what this is a picture of, taking refuge in a humanly contrived system of religion. See, they were, they had they they built an altar. They built altars. They had altars at Bethel. They were engaged in. They they paid tithes every three years. Yeah. Every three years. God said every time they had a harvest, but every three years. So they did religious things. They had vials. They had they had really they had a praise band vials and instruments. We're going to talk about them. Amos is going to talk about them. Said God can't stand your music. Yeah. Going to tell them. It's like being in the house. <coughs> God talked about people who made it into the house. He said, uh, 
Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Your religion is a sin. Yeah. Here's what he said. Yeah. Yeah. You transgress God's commandment by your tradition, which was their religion, their humanly imposed religion. Well, to transgress the word of God. <coughs> oh, how about this? You have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. If you want to make sure people don't obey God, have them come to your church. What? That's kind of strong. I know that's kind of. <laughs> I know that's kind of strong. But that's what he's talking about. The commandment of God. When you're around this kind of a traditional environment, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did you wash your hands? Mm, yeah. See? Yeah. Did you wa what? How was that vessel washed? Yeah. Now, they were sticklers for this now, mm -hmm. but they made void mm -hmm. the commandment of God. Right. God can't even talk to people in that kind of environment. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not I say he won't talk. Do it. Here's another. Full well ye reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Well, <laughs> that's a bad translation. That's what that is. Why did you say that? So I could keep my tradition. Yeah. Well, that's, that's written on the old scriptures that are done away. That doesn't apply to us. Why did you say that? So they could keep their tradition. <laughs> that's why. <coughs> Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Don't you know that? Why did you say that? So we could keep our tradition. Yes. That's why we said it. Jesus stood over Jerusalem and wept before he left. And here's what he said while he was weeping. If thou hast known, even now at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they're hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of, the visitation, of thy visitation. Now, there are records of the destruction of Jerusalem, historical records. If you can find some of them, they'll stand your hair on end, boy, I'll tell you. It was unimaginable. There was such a severe famine, the people were eating their children. They ate dead animals. They were besieged for two or, two or three years. They were besieged. And the way the Roman armies got in, they built ramparts. They stacked the dirt up against the wall, and then they just walked over it, compassed them about. Mm -hmm. The hatred was to such an extent among the Jews yeah. that more Jews were killed by Jews yeah, than the Romans yes. killed. Yeah, there was a great conflict among the, themselves. Yeah, there was three factions. It was, ter it, was, it was terrible. I mean, you, you can only read, you got to read it in sections. It's so bad. But that's what he's talking about here. This is something God can do. If he's capable of doing this, and it be righteous. It's always preceded by plenty of time to adjust, uh, yeah, right. adjust the life. Israel stands as a warning sign for every professed believer <coughs> that does not take advantage of what God gives them. If God pours out a blessing... Don't you come with a thimble. Okay, some people do. They have such a shrunk, shrunk up capacity, they can't. They really can't take much. This is dangerous. This is dangerous to have God pouring and a person with a little bitty container under there. This is, well, it doesn't require any further comment. God's not willing that any should perish, so he's made full provision for everybody to stay out of this category. Amen. And I'm, I'm grateful yes. that he did. All right, let's see this last, uh, the last expression. Yes. A couple, couple of thoughts here. There's a, 
it's a huge part of human nature to seek for some kind of security. Uh -huh. That's in, right. In life, That's Every, right. everybody's looking for something that will that will make them feel like they're safe and secure. Yeah. But they but they seek it in things that aren't God. Yeah. Mm. The, the scripture says that the Lord is our sanctuary. He's our refuge. And it's it's offensive to God. It's actually a form of idolatry to seek comfort or security or safety in anything other than God. Amen. Right. Even maybe even especially religion. Amen. Yes. And another thought about religion, you said that religion is act actually sinful. It made me think of what Jesus said. He said to the Pharisees, they strain out a gnat swallow a and swallow a camel. What, what that means is that religious people major in minors. They strain out a gnat. Yeah. It's like, that's like majoring. Let's dissect this gnat now. Make sure we get this right, you know. Mm. And then they swallow a camel means they just overlook some huge gross sin or immorality. Yeah. So there, there are churches, see, that are very meticulous about their liturgy. Mm. We've got to make sure we get this liturgy right and light the right candles and have the smoke. And they overlook all kinds of gross immorality yeah. and false yeah. doctrine. Yeah. They strain out a gnat mm -hmm. swallow and, a and swallow a camel. Yeah. They, it's it's strange, but it's, it's, but, it's but it's true if you it's know anything true. at all about religion. <laughs> Good parallel verse to that too. I think it's in Jeremiah 48, 44 when the prophet says, He that flees from the fear shall fall into the pit. That's yes, right. And he that getteth up out of the pit shall be taken in the snare. That's right. You mm -hmm. have those three yeah. things going Can't on. Can't escape, there. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, verse 20 says, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. All right, now God is showing the vanity of a contrived religion, what Jason's been talking about there. It can't save you. It can't help you. It can't sanctify you. It can't, can't make you pleasing to God. Man's approach to religion can do none of those things, all professions notwithstanding. We're talking about the true God here. That's the one that Jesus gives us an understanding of. Jesus has come to give us an understanding of him that is true, the real God, 1 John 5, 20. <clears throat> and that's the God that's being expounded by Amos. He's expounding that God without an intercessor, uh, without a Savior, without the blood of the everlasting covenants. He's he describing what... What a people been tutored by God, how they fared under without all of this, without these all spiritual blessings, without all things pertaining to life and godliness, without peace with God. This is how we'd fare the same way. If it wasn't for a better covenant established on better promises. In God's dealings with the nations through the prophets, God displayed that he doesn't care where sin is found is intolerant of it. Even if it's in heathen nations that have no covenant or an old law or anything like that, it's the nature of sin. God is not just concerned about who sins. It isn't that some people can sin and get by with it, like we're all sinners, but we're forgiven, you know, that sort of approach. It's sin is what God has the issue with. And that's the issue that Jesus settled. We, that's why I, I grateful he did, too. In God's dealings, he makes sure you know what he thinks about sin and what can be done about it. <laughs> the day of the Lord. <coughs> Shall not the day of the Lord. Other versions I read the day of Jehovah or the Lord's day of judgment or the day of Yahweh or the day when the Lord judges, the Lord's special day and God's coming. The Lord's, the day of the Lord is a day when everybody but God is a spectator. It's his time. No competition. No resistance. No wars. No arguments. 
It's his day. No pretense. It's his day, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is mentioned, that phrase, the day of the Lord, is mentioned 21 times in Scripture. <coughs> 17 of them are in the prophets from Isaiah through Zechariah, and four of them are in 1 Corinthians through 2 Peter. Interesting, isn't it? Zephaniah, he mentions the great day of the Lord, and Joel mentions the terrible day of the Lord. Acts mentions the great and notable day of the Lord. See, sir. <laughs> Several times this phrase refers to the coming of Christ and the uh, end of the world. Paul also wrote of the day of the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. and the day of Christ. See, so it's, that's all the same day we're yeah, talking right. about. It's all the same day. When this phrase was used by Joel and the prophets, it ordinarily referred to some unavoidable act of divine judgment. The exception Joel mentioned the great and terrible day of the Lord. He talked about the end. But most of the time the day of the Lord was a time of visitation. I'm coming to visit the sins of the people upon them. On this kind of day men they are responders. They just they just spectate and respect law God's mercy. No resistance, no anarchy or rebellion. See, the day of the Lord will confirm he is really sovereign. Amen. Amen. Jesus is really the one and only potentate. Yeah. He really is. This is just isn't a, a nice saying. This is the way it really is. And when anyone sees them as they are, they wither. Yeah, right. There are no resistance. Mm -hmm. Even the demons, yeah. they recognize who Jesus was. Nobody else did, but they recognize who Jesus was. They, they didn't uh, launch an initiative against him. <coughs> Amos is speaking to Israel of a time when God will quote, as Jeremiah said, remember their iniquity and visit their sins. We've mentioned here quite a few times recently that when God looks on something, he does something about it. Whether it's to show mercy or whether it's to show judgment. The psalmist will say, look on us, look on me. He wanted, because he knew God. He knew God. He knew God's nature. If God just look and see this situation, I mean, He'll do something about it. Yeah. Or look on my enemies. Look at them. Look at them, Lord. Look what they're doing. <coughs> so the day belongs to God exclusively. Once, since Jesus has been exalted and enthroned to the right hand of God, the day of the Lord refers to His return. That's what it's talking about now. That's the next big thing on the divine agenda. He's going to come with all his glory in the Father's glory and the glory of the holy angels. That's a bunch of glory, let me tell you. And he's going to come with all that glory, and he's not going to confront like a, a army down here. Say, we'll show you. We're going to rebel. This isn't going to happen. Not on the day of the Lord. Now he says, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness, even very dark with no brightness in it? Now he's talking about judgment for Israel, I understand. A darkness is a, is a frightening thing. The only th time I ever experienced total darkness was in one of the caves, one of the Missouri caves here. And I did, boy... I didn't feel comfortable. <laughs> Put it that way. It was just total darkness. It wasn't a, wasn't a, wasn't a pinpoint of light. Yeah. And a man took a match. We were in like a cavern. He lit that match, and I could see everybody in the cavern. Yeah. Yeah. That little match. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you got to seek some light. Right. You could just have some light. Yeah. Even if it's a smoking flax light. Some light. But he said, for you, when the day of the Lord comes, total darkness. Yeah. He's fear will dominate. There'll be no hope, in other words. There'll be no hope. Total darkness. And he told him, I'm going to come now. For three, yet four transgressions, you've sinned. I'm going to come. I'm going to visit you. I'm going to punish you. I'm telling you ahead of time now. I'm going to punish you. 
He tells Amos to tell them that the remnant will get the two legs and the lamb's ear out of the mouth. We're going to save a remnant. We're not going to destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. I'm not going to do that. Day of the Lord, for everybody else, it's going to be a day of darkness. You won't be able to see to do anything. If you, if, if the thought entered someone's mind to mount a rebellion, they couldn't see to do it. Right. Total darkness. At that time, sinners will confront God without a single helpful resource. Now, I... I'm afraid of confronting God like that. I don't want to confront God without anything outside my own person to help me. Yeah. Particularly like the Lord Jesus or the grace of God. Or <laughs> but there won't be any for, the, for those that are not reconciled to God. There will be no help. There will be nothing for relief. There will be nothing to cause the fear to subside. It's only going to get worse. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It, it is, brother. It's a fearful thing to do it. We don't want to talk about this all the time, but we want to talk about it enough so we don't forget it, Amen. that we remember it. <clears throat> Hosea said of Israel, they have, done, they have deeply corrupted themselves, as in the days of Gibeah. Therefore, he will remember their iniquity. He will visit their sins. Jeremiah said, I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings, saith the Lord, and I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round about. I'll burn up your religion. God's going to do it. When Jesus comes again, false religion is going to all be burned up. <laughs> People may be dependent on it now. They'll not be able. You won't be able to depend on it then. There'll be even very dark. That line, even very dark, and then and no brightness in it. He just brings it home very strongly. The next day of the Lord will be the coming of the Lord Jesus. It'll be unparalleled. Darkness will be outer darkness. So what exactly is outer darkness. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Um, darkness, you remember, is associated with what was before creation. It was, <laughs> it's, associated with, it's associated with chaos yeah. or the absence of order and form. Yeah. It's associated with emptiness or yeah. nothingness. <laughs> it's the opposite <laughs> of creation. Now, yeah. so wrath, in a sense, or darkness is associated with God's wrath it's the opposite of creation. Yeah. It's uncreation. Yeah. Or the it's the opposite of life. Yeah. Because mm. we're going to inherit eternal life. Yeah. See? Or hell is the outer darkness. It's, it's the absence of everything good. Yeah. It's mm. the Amen. absence of life. It's not the absence of existence. No, no. It's the yeah. absence of life. That's right. When God created the world, he said, This is good. Now here's a thought I had on this. That has to do with why it's that way. Outside, it means it's completely separate from God. There's going to be nothing of God in hell. Okay, now you can't go any place and flee his presence. But out, outer darkness is outside the parameter of divine influence. He's going to thrust all of it. He's waiting until the, till the day of Christ to do this. But he's going to thrust from him everything and anyone and everyone that is not accustomed to light is going to thrust them out. They'll be separate, no access to God, no access to relief, won't be able to pray, won't be able to have a friend, no be no such thing as companionship, be no such thing as rest. It's a dreadful thing to think about. But all the things that we have, we, we may have grown accustomed to the help and comfort and sleep and rest and subsiding of pain. and That's all because you're in the domain ruled by God. That's why those, those temporary reliefs are there. But, it, but this, we're talking about outer darkness. 
cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. What's out there, Lord? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. See? about coming in. That's right. Coming, That's in, right. Entering in. That's right. Or, or on the day of judgment says, well done, good and faithful yes, service. Sir. Enter and in. Now, into the joy of inter, the Lord's inter, inter, glory is being welcomed home. That's right. Yes. Out of darkness is being on the outside. That's right. What a picture, I tell you. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Well, and in you know John, what? he says that the light shines in the darkness yeah. and the darkness does not comprehend, comprehend it. Like but what you're speaking of is where the light isn't even shining. That's right. See, that's... Yeah. Amen. Yeah, there's some no no person, so far as we know at this point, occupies that yeah. place yet. Although it, the next thing to it, where the rich man was, but he could see. <laughs> he, see, he saw he saw Lazarus. It was a miserable thing to, for him to see. He was comforted. See? Anyway, go ahead, sister. That would be a great recognition of what God did do. I mean, now people deny the Lord, you yeah. know, and things. But then, we know they won't be able to deny yeah. They'll see. But they'll even know in this outer darkness all the things that he upheld right. and what he did That's and right. all that this total nothingness without him. Jesus said here in Mark, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The worm, that's not like a maggot. It's, a, it's, it's even a, a, an English definition of the word. It's the gnawing conscience. It's the conscience gnawing all the times that you had, here's where he visited me, there's where he visited me, here's where I was called, I was moved here. They'll never be able to blot that out of their minds, and the fire's not quenched. It'll, their passion will burn, but no expression for their passion. They've cultured a lifetime wanting this and wanting that, and now in outer darkness they can't have anything. They still want it. They can't have it. Well, we're going to have everything we want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about that. And go out no more. Go out no more. Amen. See the what a contrast. That's what we remind want to remind you that God has provided a, a way out of this dilemma, being in this mm -hmm. dilemma, a way to come in, stay in, and when you're in, get closer. See, once you're in, you get you draw an eye. Get closer. Jesus, whenever he uh, took sin upon himself, he knew what this feeling right. was. I mean, he knew it. Oh, yeah. He's the only one that could know that, and he still agreed to do what he That's did. That's right. <laughs> he had never felt the contamination of sin. He would never had a contaminating, poisonous thought. And then... When the sins of the world laid upon him, all the sins of the whole world were laid. He felt the sudden impact, not of a mm -hmm. one transgression has driven, drove Judas to the hang himself. Mm -hmm. Think of all the sins of the world are the impact that had upon the, the soul of Jesus. See, that was, no, he drew back. That's why he drew back. It wasn't that he was afraid of the pain and all this. There were two thieves went through all the pain he went through. See, that wasn't it. You weren't, you weren't saved by the physical sufferings of Christ that were atrocious. Even his visage was marred more than any of the sons of men, but that's not what saved you. Right. It's his soul being made an offering for sin. That's what saved you. And he, knowing what this was, what was involved, he was willing to forfeit his will to do the will of God. Amen. See, now you, he will give you the ability to do that too. Amen. See, there's some things that will be just as hard for you as that was for him. Right. And you'll have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. Thy will or mine. Yeah. And you want to learn to say, nevertheless. Yeah. If, there's some, if there's some way I can avoid this, if not, thy will be done. That's right. Then you'll strengthen you, see? And you'll be able to come out of it, in other words. Yeah. You, won't, you won't be consumed by it. 
Well, those are some of the thoughts I had today that I tell you, I have a deep admiration for these prophets. If this was all you had to preach, I mean, you'd, it would affect you. I would think it would, it would affect you. You'd have to spend a lot of time with the Lord and thanksgiving and things like this. This just a line on line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little, just kept on laying it on. Yeah. Now you come over into the new covenant, and he keeps on laying it on, but it's blessing, grace. See, it's a different, <laughs> it's a completely different arrangement. Yes, brother. Don't like to th talk about or think about the doctrine of hell, and the one thing that's especially objectionable to people is the eternality. Oh yeah. Hell. So so now we have a doctrine that uh, people in hell just burn up after a while; they'll be consumed. Yeah. And some people actually will say, "Well, this this makes God more merciful." That's right. They can't they can't picture a God who would send people to hell for eternity. It's almost too it's almost too terrible to, for us to think about. So I I've done a little thinking about this and uh, I think one one reason hell is, the scriptures do depict hell as being eternal. You you can't get away from that. Yeah. You have to somehow modify what the scripture says. And I think the reason for that is because God's glory is infinite. The thing that sinners reject, yeah. God's glory is infinite. That's right. Good. Yeah. Amen. So, here's a here's a human illustration. Now we're getting away from this in our society. It used to be if you killed someone, you forfeited your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or or if you weren't sent to death row, you spent your life in prison. See? Cuz why? Because a human life is worth something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See? Well, God's glory is worth is infinitely That's worth. Right something. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> it's infinitely worthy, I should say. It couldn't be satisfied by a temporal punishment. Yeah. That's right. And another another thought, too, is that, that those in hell will... And remember, people aren't going to be the only ones in hell. Hell was actually prepared for the devil and his angels. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, not for man. So those in hell altogether will somehow serve as some kind of a memorial for all eternity of the consequences of yeah. rejecting God. There'll be no friendship. The devil will just be one of the group. Yeah. You're not going to have any leaders. That's right. He, he, told them on the, the, he told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Yeah. Hell is called the second death. death. It's, a picture of, it's a picture of existence without God. Yeah. Yeah. Separation from God, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> Anyone else tonight? Let's have a word of prayer. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we're, we're grateful for the prophet Amos and for his faithfulness to deliver this message, which we know was not a pleasant one to deliver. But we confess that we do need to know this aspect of your person to keep it in mind. And we thank you this is not the only trait you have, but that you are full of mercy and compassion and grace. We thank you that you provide a Savior that allows us to, so to speak, tap in to all of that goodness. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.